This morning, I want to share some thoughts on becoming a father of faith. And I'll be honest, uh, there, there are three fathers in the room. But what this, these passages say uh, pertains to all of us. What? I don't think, I think oh, know. three besides me. <laughs> <laughs> I count out there three. <laughs> I'm talking to three. Something like that. Well, I guess I need to preach to myself too. <laughs> David in Psalm 1. It's interesting because as we are several of us guys are doing the leadership journey. This passage just came up. And uh, David writes this, blessed is the man or how happy. I like blessed better than how happy. The, the Holman says how happy is the man. I, I, happiness does not contain enough of what it means to be blessed. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. That state of blessing is the idea of, yes, happiness, prosperity, state of well-being, but it's there's also a sense, and it's used by Jesus in the, Mount, in the Sermon on the Mount, in the Beatitudes, blessed are they, that it's a state of acceptable to God. This should be the man that, and woman, speaking to fathers, Specifically, specifically this morning. So if you're not a father, you just add who you are in there. But this is how we, what we should desire to be. This passage gives us a, uh, a template, if you will, of what we should be striving for. It does so, first of all, in the negative. A man who is blessed is not one who is walking in the counsel of the wicked. We have to be careful who we're getting directions from in life. We, we have to be careful that we don't go to the world for answers that we should be going to the book for. Fathers especially. I was... Recently talking to somebody. And we were talking about the state of America today. And why things are to some degree where they're at. And why we were specifically talking about school shootings. And I said, let me tell you what I think. Well, he asked my opinion. <laughs> I wasn't just giving my opinion r randomly. I said in the 1960s, my generation was raised under the book written by Dr. Spock and others that ended all discipline and began to teach a child-centric home where the children are allowed to do whatever they want without much correction. Those children grew up, and this isn't true of everybody, obviously, but a lot of society. Those children grew up and became parents without any understanding of what good parenting really is. Because their parents followed a, a methodology that has since been pretty well abandoned, by the way. And other things have taken its place. And now we, we had, in the 80s and 90s, a whole new generation of parents that had not been taught good parenting by their parents because their parents had rejected the parenting of their parents. And we also have a falling away from the church and the teachings of Scripture. 
we are walk we are seeing more and more people walking in the counsel of the ungodly following the directions from people who are not god centric who are not bible centric who do not see the word of god as the supreme authority for all faith and practice all of a life answers are in the book we teach that right vbs this week what are we going to teach them look at the book look at the book we keep teaching them look at the book but somehow when it comes to certain things we say oh the book doesn't answer that so i'm going to go over here and start listening to the counsel of the wicked but it goes further than that he goes on and says we stop just listening to the council and we start sitting in the seat of the counselor we start giving that same advice we sit in the uh oh, i'm sorry we stand we stop walking and hearing this and we start standing and taking part in it and then we sit down in the seat of the scoffers and we start ridiculing the biblical way of doing things begin to practice those things instead david says the blessed man delights in what does it say there the law of the Lord, the word of God, delighting in the word. We've been reading a book in our men's group. And I just lost the title of it. Spiritual, discipline. Spiritual disciplines. And the chapters we've been on have been talking about Bible input and how important Bible input is in your life. You are getting Bible input this morning. If it's the only time if this was related to eating and this was the only time in the week you ever ate a meal, how healthy would you be? Would you be able to get up and walk or do anything? Yeah, the, the idea is we need Bible input daily. You need to be in your Bible daily. Young people, listen to me. You need to be reading the Bible daily or listening to it on your on your app or somehow getting Bible input. Your delight, the thing that you want to do the most needs to be looking at the word of God. And finding in it the treasures. I'll tell you. We do the thing that we delight in, the thing that makes us happy. We do. We don't have any problem doing that over and over and over and over what we need to be delighting in is being in the book, being in the word of God. And I have been not just excited about this book we're reading and about the truths that he's really bringing out, but I've been somewhat convicted that I need to do better. And I'll tell you, if I need to do better, what does that mean for each of you? Probably all of us could do better, couldn't we? Now, there may be somebody sitting here or listening this morning that, that spends an hour and a half reading his Bible every day or her Bible every day. I really kind of doubt it. <laughs> we can always do more. We need to delight in. And notice what he says. He meditates on it. Meditating is to think through Scripture. To constantly been thinking about how, do you, how can you meditate on something you haven't read and that you've had something that you haven't read well enough and thought enough about when reading it to remember, which may require what? Memorization, right? If we don't know the word, we can't meditate on the word. If we can't meditate on the word, we cannot dig out its truths. When we go there, when we start delighting in the law of God, he says, we're like a tree planted by streams of water, yielding fruit in season, always getting all the nourishment it needs because the roots are deep and soaking up what it needs for life. Anybody had to shut your sprinklers off because of water restrictions? 
what happens to you I, I, I want you to as you as you leave today I want you to look at the trees along the sidewalk they're not getting water at all they're not watering them. valley has chosen to shut off the water do they look healthy to you they're not trees planted by the springs of the water are they alive for now they're getting just enough to stay alive you know, Christians, sometimes that's us, isn't it? We, we're we alive. We're, we're a believer. We, we, we're in church. We're getting just enough to eke out an existence. But are we healthy? Or are our leaves dropping? Are we prospering? Are we bearing fruit? My dad and now my brother raised walnut trees for years and they carefully monitor how moist the ground is to make sure those trees are getting all the water they need. And they carefully monitor the tree. And if a tree in the middle of summer starts dropping its leaves, they know there's something seriously wrong. And either that tree has to have something radically done to it to get it healthy again, or that tree gets removed and a new tree planted. You know, eventually God, if we're not soaking in the word of God, if we're not like that tree planted by the water, if we're the man that is in the first verse of this, that is w walking in the path of sinners and standing and sitting, eventually God removes us. Takes us out of, either out of, of ministry or even takes our life. We need to be the one planted by the rivers of water so that we can prosper, producing fruit, the fruit of faith, the fruit of the Spirit, not diseased fruit, not fruit that is unhealthy, but prosperous. And God will give us prosperity when we're in his word. Second passage I want to take you to, and I'm, I, I'm jumping a little bit this morning, so I want you to just kind of stay with me. So the characteristics, the call to be a man of faith, the call to be the tree planted by the water, continues in the third proverb, verse 5 and 6, and you probably know this passage well. So I'll remind you of it this morning. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight there is one and only one where to put this kind of trust in Yahweh the Lord God if we're the kind of man that David described in Psalm 1 who's listening to the counsel of the ungodly then we're not trusting him 100% we're not saying I trust you with all of my heart. We're saying, well, yeah, God, I trust you, but I'm going to make my own plans and I'm going to, I'm going to listen to, to, because, you know, I'm just not finding the, the right answers. You know what? If you're not finding the right answers, it's because you haven't looked hard enough. God will direct our paths. When we trust him, when we say, we know you're in this, whatever it is, Acknowledge him in all of our ways. When we acknowledge that God is active in all aspects of our life. You know, sometimes we forget that, that God's part of our work. And that God's part of our play. And, and that God's part of our spiritual life. We, that's easy, right? But sometimes we, we put God in a box. And he's only over here in the spiritual life and everywhere else. Well, I've got to do that. Now, I'm not saying that you don't need to be actively doing. We're called to work. We're called to do. But are we actively recognizing that God is a at work in those parts of our life? Newhauser, in his book, Opening a Proverb, said this, Trust God exclusively. 
do not lean on your own understanding. By nature, we are inclined to foolishly rely on our own inclinations and desires. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each one has turned his own way, said Isaiah in the 50, his 50, 53rd chapter. Most people make crucial life decisions in areas such as marriage, finance, and, and vocation, not based on God's word, but on their feelings. What have, we, what have we said about where the heart leads us? Where our feelings lead us? Do our feelings lead us to right answers or wrong answers? Yeah. Proverbs tells us that our feelings are unreliable, says Newhouser. There is a way which seems right to a man, but the end of the way is death. Proverbs 14, verse 12. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. Proverbs 28, 26. A man may feel he would be happier if he were to divorce his wife. A mother may not feel like using the rod of discipline on her children. In their quest to grow, churches may be tempted to resort on worldly methodologies that compromise biblical principles. The wise man does not lean on his own understanding, but trusts that God's way is best. The one who chooses his own way arrogantly claims that he knows better than God. That's a pretty bold statement, isn't it? But it's true. We have to recognize that God is part of every part of our life. And when we acknowledge him and when we lean on him, what's the proverb say is going to happen? It's like a straight road. No longer with curves or turns that we don't know where we're going. God makes our paths straight. That's the kind of man kind of father that we're called to be and I would say again all of us are called to be that looking a little more specifically at fatherhood I'm going to go to the New Testament for a little bit in 1st Thessalonians chapter 2 and Ephesians chapter 5 we are going to kind of give you a little bit of the responsibilities of fatherhood. In Ephesians 5, it says clearly, husbands, love your wives. The first responsibility of fatherhood is to love your wife. That's not having anything to do with kids. Yes, it does. It has everything to do with kids. And you're to love your wife in this way, as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Complete, total sacrifice. You know what? That is completely, totally against the way I think and do things in my natural state. How about the rest of you? Anybody else with me? Do I do things completely sacrificially for others? How about you? Nope. That is not how I think and do. But that's how I'm supposed to. That's what God calls me to do. We're also towards our children from Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 2. Uh, Paul speaking of the church, I think is applicable to how a parent, a father should be towards his children. We are to encourage, comfort, implore each of them to walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Encourage them. The, the word encourage is to exhort, to, to spur them on. To get them going in the right direction. We have a job as parents towards our kids. And that is to encourage them or to comfort them when life is rough. Right? Anybody ever had to comfort your kids? Always. I mean, right? Kids are still learning how to deal with their own feelings and issues. And finally, implore them. The word implore is to testify, to bear witness, to motivate them to walk worthy of God. Proverbs. 
Proverbs 13, 24 says this, whoever spares the rod hates his son. Whoa, wait a second. We're to discipline them because of love, because the one who loves, who loves him, is diligent to discipline. Proverbs says if you don't discipline, which is what was taught back in the 60s, right, Dr. Spock? Oh, if you love your kid, you will never discipline them, whether that's by spanking or any other method. When in reality, the Bible has said all these centuries long, the one that doesn't discipline hates their children. Now, that doesn't mean you have these this boiled up feelings of animosity and, and anger. Nana will tell you in just a second what the definition of love is. Doing what's best for the one loved. So if love is doing what's the best for the one loved, hatred is doing what's not best for the one loved. So if you say you love your children and you don't discipline them, you're not loving them, you're hating them. But it has nothing to do with how you feel. It has nothing to do with how you feel. You can be all ushy-gushy inside and love them and say, oh, because I love you, I'm not going to discipline you. And you're still hating your child. And that's true for us as parents. It's true for us as aunts and uncles siblings now realize that levels of discipline teaching discipline are different for a brother got some brothers in the back row both back rows then it would be for a parent to a child but these principles still apply we're also to teach out of Ephesians 6, verse 4, it says this. Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children. The old, the old translation said, provoke, don't provoke your children to wrath. Don't stir up anger. But bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Two things here. We're not to stir up anger, but we are to teach them in the instruction and training of the Lord. So I wanted to explore with you for a moment and, and I'm stepping away from scripture a little bit as far as scripture does not clearly define what that means. And so as we've looked at godly men who have looked at this issue and, and talked about what kinds of things stir up anger, and looking at scriptural principles. I want to give you a bunch. I'm not even sure how many I have here because there's more. Things that will cause children to be resentful and angry that we need to avoid doing. And fathers need to avoid doing this and Grandmas and grandpas need to avoid doing this and aunts and uncles need to avoid doing these things. Of course, only moms and dads can have marital disharmony. One of the key things in raising kids is mom and dad needs to be on the same page. I should hear a couple amens out there. <laughs> marital disharmony where you're never in agreement on what you're doing is a problem. Letting your children pit one of you against the other is always a problem. I'm going to use the Griggs for, for a second. One of their girls comes and asks mom, is it okay if I do this? And she says no, because she's the meanie. No. <laughs> says no. So they go to dad. Dad says yes. Later, mom and dad find out that their daughter went to both of them until she got the answer she wanted. The answer that needs to be given is, if either of us say yes or no, that's the final answer. And if you try to go to another person, it's going to be problems. Right? Anybody, any child here ever did that? Raise your hand if you, if you ever did that. Yeah, uh, my girls are raising their hands. <laughs> Marital harmony means... 
that you're always, and if if you dis, if there's a disagreement, you go and talk about it until you come up with one answer. Marital disharmony will drive children to wrath. A child-centered home. I mentioned that concept a few minutes ago when I talked about what the results were of some of the parental advice that came out of the world. When the child is in charge and does not have boundaries, there will be more anger within that child than a child who has the proper safety net and boundaries. I'm going to speed up just a little bit. Modeling sinful anger. There's righteous anger. Don't forget that. Not all anger is sinful. Anger against something that has gone against God. Anger that is not personal is righteous. Anger that's, that's personal, you've offended me, is always unrighteous. So modeling, yelling and screaming because you've been offended at your children is going to stir up anger. Disciplining and anger. Never, never, never discipline the child until you've calmed down. Inconsistent discipline. Oh, you disciplined this way for this last time, but you didn't do it this time, or this child got that discipline, but this child didn't. I know, hush. We weren't <laughs> perfect either. Double standards. Rules for rules sake without explanation, especially as kids get older, you need to be able to say, this is why that's a rule in this house. Not saying I'm sorry. If you mess up, guess the two words that you need to be saying. I'm sorry, I messed up. They need to see you model that. When a child can do nothing right, that's a problem. That's a problem. My children are back there smiling at me like I'm, 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 just, I'm just gonna ignore yeah, that I'm back corner. <laughs> Reversing parental roles. God gave a proper structure to the family. And I'm not going to go into all that for time's sake this morning. But we shouldn't reverse the roles God's given. Not listening to your kids. Now there's times when the kid doesn't it needs to not try to explain themselves. They're walking out into a road and you say, stop! They better stop and not have... But I want to go on... No! They need to be able to know that for their safety, they need to stop. They get to talk later. And not get run over by the truck. Comparing one child to another. Don't do that. They're all unique. No time to talk. I guess I already said that. Too much freedom. Too much freedom can cause a child to become angry. There's a lot of reasons for that. Too little freedom. And of course, physical abuse, unreal expect, unrealistic expectations, and many, many more. We have to be careful that we do both parts of that Ephesians chapter 6. Not provoking that the anger is only half the, half the battle. We also need to bring them up in the teaching and instruction of the Lord. Both have to happen. And if you expect that to only happen at church, that's not going to happen. Church is part of that. And it should be part of that. It's an integral part of that. But it has to be carried home too. And the one that needs to be doing a lot of that is the dad. The father. Bringing them up. How? Well, we come back to a passage we've talked about before Proverbs chapter 6 these words that I'm giving you today are to be in your heart repeat them to your children talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up so when you're sitting in the house having a meal you don't have to only talk about the Bible the entire meal but it's a time for instruction it's a time to model. It's a time to be teaching. When you're walking in the way, we don't walk very many places anymore. 
and you're driving in the car. An opportunity. You have a captive audience for the little ones. And the only one with little ones in here is the Griggs. But I'm talking to a bigger audience. They're strapped into those car seats and they have to listen to you. You know? <laughs> Why not? Use it as an opportunity to tell the stories of the Bible. I talked before when I talked about this. Put on a, a Christian-based story like Adventures in Odyssey. And when you're getting up and lying down, bedtime stories, when they get up, evening and morning, always, always, though, teach by example. Anyone that teaches one thing and lives another will not be listened to. Now, are we all perfect in what we in following that? Nope. There's plenty of times that I as a father and my children attest to it because they're back there laughing at me. <laughs> I have I actually have all four of my girls in church today. This is what a wonderful wonder what a wonderful father's day. <laughs> <sighs> I'm going to take it as a wonderful <laughs> Father's Day. <laughs> We're not called to be perfect. But we are called to strive to godliness. And I would say today, teaching by example needs giving proper honor to fathers today. For those with little ones, honoring their father. Mom showing how to honor their father. Mom leads by example there. For the rest of us, as we are able to be with our fathers, my dad is now almost 84 years old. He'll be 84 this fall. We're going to go honor him today. In fact, I honored him by making his favorite. I made him homemade ice cream for today. And he loves my homemade ice cream. <laughs> right? So, and we're going to have a wonderful time together Honor father. Maybe maybe the father in somebody's life is not one that's honorable. I will tell you that the Bible doesn't say honor those fathers that are worthy of honor. It told the children of Israel in the Ten Commandments, honor your father and your mother. Period. It doesn't matter who they are or what they've done. The commandment is to you, not them. You're to honor in whatever way you can. So what is our testimony today with our family? What is our testimony today with our church? Are we being the kind of person and specifically the kind of fathers that God wants us to be? We do not deserve any honor because we're just sinful human beings. But as we follow Christ, we need to honor especially those godly fathers. Hold them up as an example. Father God, we thank you for this day. Thank you that you've instructed us in your word. Help us to pass that down to children and grandchildren that they might grow up knowing you. Help us to be soaking up the word of God so that we might have, be living a healthy Christian life. Help us to seek your word for the answers to our needs, our daily decisions. Not our own understanding, not our own feelings, not our own uh, decisions. Help us to recognize that you're in every aspect of our life. And as we acknowledge you in that, you'll make the way clear. Oh, Father, we're so thankful that we can turn to you in this. In Jesus' name, amen.